I'm Tully. I was born in Nottingham and I'm a GB paraswimmer. So I was born with cerebral palsy. So it's not, we're not 100% certain when the dystonia developed or if I was born with it, but I was diagnosed with generalized dystonia at the age of 16. When I was 13, that was when we first noticed symptoms that definitely weren't part of the cerebral palsy. I think looking back, I had symptoms earlier in my early years that were symptoms of dystonia, but because I already had cerebral palsy, they weren't picked up on. So the treatment I've received has been nerve blocks because I've had really bad nerve pain. So I started having pulse radio frequent nerve blocks for my shoulders. I've had Botox and then I've tried things like progabalin, cocodamol, baclofen, like muscle relaxants and painkillers. So the first dystonic symptoms that I noticed that were different than just the cerebral palsy was that when I was 13, my left foot suddenly turned in and wouldn't go back, which isn't very typical of cerebral palsy. And for a few years after that, my symptoms were quite stable, but then I had a massive progression again. I developed dystonia in many of the parts of my body, including both shoulders and my right knee. So when I first got the symptoms, I was like 13, 14, and I was pretty confused what to, what, as to what was going on because I'd spent time around other people with cerebral palsy being a swimmer and none of them were getting worse. So I was really confused, like what, what was wrong with me, what was going on. Um, I was very frustrated when I, about 14, 15, I wasn't able to walk far enough to actually go to swimming competitions and compete because I couldn't walk from the hotel to the pool and I wasn't able to walk around poolside to get to where we would all sit. So I started needing to use a wheelchair for like sport and daily life. And I hated it. I hated the fact that everyone would stare at me. I hated the fact that I was different. Um, it was embarrassing having to explain, try and explain to my friends like why that I'd gotten worse because I, I wasn't diagnosed at that point. So I didn't know how to explain it because I didn't know what was going on. So that was really, really tough for me. So as soon as the left foot turned in, we went to my usual physio to get help to see what it was. And at first on the phone, she was like, oh, don't worry, like muscles get tighter with cerebral palsy as you get older. And then when she saw how turned in my foot was and that it was fixed, she got pretty worried and sent me straight back to my neurologist, who then started running tests to try and figure out what could be wrong. So I had many tests to try and find a diagnosis of what I had. Originally, it was thought that I had hereditary spastic paraplegia. And then they found that that wasn't what I had. So then my neurologist at the time at Bowman Children's assumed that I had dopa responsive dystonia and he told me at the age of 14 that if I took L-dopa for six months that I would be cured and that, that that was definitely what I had and he gave me false hope. So the drug didn't work at all and in fact I was getting worse. So when I went back to see him he had no idea what it was so he basically said it must be psychological that I must be either making it up or it must be in my head because he didn't know what was wrong. So because at that point... I was in between the age of moving to adult services. He completely discharged me. So we ended up going to the PAL service to complain. And I got put on an adolescent service, which was like a transition service. So I got to see an adult and a pediatric neurologist who specialised in dystonia. They uh, did repeated tests like MRIs. They did um, muscle, muscle conduction tests. And they videoed... Uh, me walking and took it to a conference and it was discussed at an international conference and then I had a lumbar puncture and the results came back that I had low dopamine levels low enough for dystonia but I also had extremely low serotonin levels so my DNA was sent to Great Ormond Street because um, apparently they'd found a few young people dystonia with low dopamine but extreme low serotonin which was unusual um, so after that and after the video analysis, that's when they decided that I had generalised dystonia. So as a young kid, I was made to swim for physiotherapy for the cerebral palsy and I really didn't enjoy it very much. I'd been to swimming lessons, but I just refused to swim. I think because I saw it as a chore, like I saw it as therapy and I didn't see it as something that was enjoyable, so I just didn't want to do it. And my mum growing up was a national level swimmer. So my brother started training at a young age. So most nights we on weeknights we would spend at the pool watching my brother swim and one day the coach just came up and said asked if I wanted to join instead of just watching so I agreed and that's where I completely fell in love with the sport so growing up I always wanted to be able to do everything my brother could 
and I was never very good at dry land sports and there were so many things that he could do that I just couldn't. But swimming, I felt we equal. I could do everything everyone else could. Like in the pool, I didn't feel like I was disabled and I could actually keep up with him and I could keep up with other kids my age. So that's what I loved. It gave me the freedom and it gave me normality really, like a normal childhood. It made me feel like I was the same as everyone else. So I started um, training at eight. When I got to about 14, I massively improved was picked up in my first para competition when I got classified. I was picked up by the GB team and put on the talent program and very quickly got put onto their podium potential and started competing for GB, which was absolutely amazing. I think I was just turned 14, my first international. I was spending about 28 hours a week training the pool and then gym sessions on top of that. And the neurologist that told me my lumbar puncture results, my parents were quite worried that my serotonin was so low because that's the happy hormone. And they told my parents that the reason that I was mentally well was because of the routine of swimming. So in 2015, my dystonia got suddenly worse to the point where I couldn't swim anymore because it was in my shoulders, it was everywhere, and I just, I couldn't physically swim. I was in so much pain. And I had to withdraw from the Rio Paralympic Games two weeks before everyone flew out. So that was a massive hurdle not only did I lose out on something that I've been training for 10 years and felt like I'd let everyone down that had helped me my family but assuming like everyone um because everyone had put so much effort in for me to get there um I also didn't have a routine I didn't know what to do I was really struggling at uni because I was in so much pain I couldn't sit in lectures I couldn't concentrate I couldn't do any sport I didn't really know what to do because for me growing up sport was a way to get out all my anger and frustrations and my disability in the water, I always swam with able-bodied people and I could keep up with most of them. So I felt normal. I didn't feel like I had a disability in the water. So it was a way of getting out my anger and also making me feel like a normal child and like I'm having a normal upbringing. So having a period where I couldn't swim was really detrimental and that's when I started to really struggle with mental health because I had nothing to focus on. I didn't At that point, I didn't have really anything positive because I was, I was really upset that, like, why me? Why has this happened to me? Why have I got so much worse again? Um, but I eventually decided to get back into sport because I felt that I just, I couldn't give up. I hadn't got to where I wanted to be. I hadn't got to Planet the Games yet. So I couldn't give up. I got back into sport and in 2018, I finally made an international team again. And that's when I qualified for the European Championships. I managed to find a way to actually swim. So I now don't have the use of my legs and I don't have full use of my arms, but the, I did find a way to get through it. There's only one stroke that I can swim now, but it's better than like they're not swimming at all. So having something to focus on to help cope with the diagnosis of dystonia really helped me. So for swimming, you've always got to put your effort in. You've got something to focus on. Every, I was training twice a day. I had something that I always had to put my focus on. It teaches you things like discipline, um, self-management, so many things that come along with it that help you grow in the way that it's a great distraction if you've got a condition like dystonia. So my, my biggest hopes and dreams are I'd love to make it to a Paralympic Games because that was the one of the main reasons why I decided to push so hard to get back into swimming because I still loved it and I hadn't achieved what I'd set out to achieve so I didn't feel like I could give up and so that's the main aim and then academically I want to finish my Masters and the main aim was eventually to be able to do a PhD but I think I've realised that it's going to take me a while because I... I thought that I might be able to do it while training and I've realised that that's probably not possible. <laughs> I'm really interested in neuromuscular physiology and research and especially looking at cerebral palsy and dystonia in sport and how um, athletes with cerebral palsy or dystonia train and react differently, how their body and fatigue mechanisms work differently to an able-bodied athlete. So hopefully I'll be able to get some like experience in like a, a lab role, research role, something like that. So to someone who's just received a diagnosis of dystonia, it is a really hard thing to cope with. One of the things that kept me going was that even on the really tough days, I know that there's always going to be someone out there that's worse off than me. And it's the same with the parents, that there's always going to be a parent out there that has a kid that's way worse off than your kid. And it is a really hard thing to deal with. But one of the things I came to terms with and I realised is that just because you have dystonia or your kid has dystonia doesn't mean their life has to end. There's still so many things you can achieve with dystonia and it might take you longer, you might have to adapt and do it differently and you might be in pain almost every day, but you can still get around it. <laughs>